I have uh, written a poem for a woman who rides a bus in New York City. She's a maid. She has two shopping bags. When the bus stops abruptly, she laughs. If the bus stops slowly, she laughs. If the bus picks up someone, she laughs. If the bus misses someone, she <laughs> So I watched her for about nine months. I thought, mm, uh-huh. Now, if you don't know black features, you may think she's laughing. But she wasn't laughing. She was simply extending her lips and making a sound. <laughs> I said, oh, I see. That's that survival apparatus. Now, let me write about that to honor this woman who helps us to survive. By her very survival, Miss Rosie, through your destruction, I stand up. So I used the poem with Mr. Paul Lawrence Dunbar's poem, Masks, and my own poem for old black men. Mr. Dunbar wrote Masks in 1892. We wear the mask that grins and lies. It shades our cheeks and hides our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile. With torn and bleeding heart, we smile and mouth with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? And they let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but oh my God, our tears to thee from tortured souls arise, and we sing. Hey, baby, Biden, we sing, hey, but oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile, but let the world think otherwise. We wear the mask. When I think about myself, <laughs> I almost laugh myself to death. My life has been one great big joke, a dance that's walked, a song was spoke. I laugh so hard, <laughs> I almost choke when I think about myself. Seventy years in these folks' world, the child I works for calls me girl. I say, <laughs> yes, ma'am, for working sake. I'm too proud to bend and too poor to break, so <laughs> I laugh until my stomach ache when I think about myself. My folks can make me split my side. I laugh so hard, <laughs> I nearly died. The tales they tell sound just like lying. They grow the fruit, but eat the rind. <laughs> I laugh <laughs> until I start to cry when I think about myself and my folks, and the little children. My fathers sit on benches. Their flesh count every plank. The slats leave dents of darkness deep in their withered flank, and they nod like broken candles, all waxed and burnt profound. They say, but sugar, it was our submission. That made your world go round. There in those pleated faces, I see the auction block, the chains and slavery's coffles, the whip and lash and stock. My father speak in voices that shred my fact and sound. They say, but sugar, it was our submission, and that made your world go round. They laughed to shield their crying. They shuffled through their dreams. They step and fetch the country and wrote the blues in screams. I understand their meaning. It could and did derive from living on the ledge of death. They kept my race alive by wearing the mask. Thank you for inviting me to join you. I, it's, uh, I almost feel after what you shared, I almost need a moment of silence. I know that there's so much of this is re, 
reflection. Um, but I, I guess for me in real time, I, I did write something, but now I'm a bit stunned. Um, I'm struck by how culture is global. You know, what I, I thought was pain that radiated only in certain circles and could only be understood by certain people, it seems to have seeped out, you know, with a clarity that's embodied in your own loss of people who were part of your congregation and friendship, your own desire to see freedom without constant bloodletting. And I appreciate your choosing Maya Angelou. I was a bit conflicted at first. Um, I mean, one, she's magnificent. So, you know, after she speaks, you know, we should just say the, the ending closing prayer and, and go home. At least that's how I feel sometimes. But other, there's another aspect. It's the complexity of our politics. And to whatever degree we are fellow or sisterly travelers on the same path towards agape, you know, I find that we have no consensus of the way forward in terms of a political path. And so, I mean, does love save us? Does love redeem us? Does love comfort us? I would say yes to all the above. Is love sufficient to free us? Honestly, I have no idea. Particularly Miss Angelou saying, you know, that our ancestors, our parents, our grandparents claim that it is their submission that allowed us to live this long. I feel that's a conflicted gift. I'd rather they had not submit, but I am grateful that to the extent that we did, I live and my children will live. But there's this grating on the nerves. There's a this shredding of the soul with every aspect of submission. So thank you for reminding me, not to say that I, I didn't know, but it's always helpful to have reminders of the spirituals and the blues and to hear it on the piano, to see it, you know, the youth singing. I mean, they're our future, right? And there's an abandonment of love in, in those songs. And in the brief time that I have with you, you know, maybe I'm exploring or trying to learn how much of that abandonment also appears in our politics. So in this world that's filled with wonder, right? It's a wonderful world. I started thinking about Louis Armstrong. Wasn't always a fan of his politics, but I do play that song when my nerves are shot. Um, the spirituals remember and remind us that we love and we are loved. And so that survival apparatus that Miss Angelou, Maya Angelou talked about as a gift coincides in our culture and all cultures, right? With an agape, in which I think I was mentioning this, or I have mentioned this several times in the last couple of months from the church that I attend in Harlem, um, from our pastors talking about agape as political will. And of course there are different forms of love. And I've tried to share that with the young people on the uh, political theology network that Villanova hosts. I mean, there's a, a recent podcast we did and there's, I don't want to go into it deeply here because that's their purview. I mean, it's they're young, their generation, they're inheriting what we were able to salvage and to leave for them, right? Both in terms of tax and love and political will. But there seems to be a debate about suffering. As you know, Angelou closes her poem, which is a performance in part, but also like a revelation of how broken we are, right? And I'm just talking about Black people here. But it, it closes in tears, right? And I'm not sure that the youth want more tears. I mean, it's it, before COVID, during COVID, af, if COVID ever ends, I imagine it will mutate. And that those of us who have access to healthcare and some affluence, that 
we will not be devastated in the ways that other communities are and other countries are, right? But this survival apparatus, a gift from Maya Angelou, embedded in black culture, I wanna talk about briefly as an expression or as a lineage or as a, a trajectory towards the agape of peaches. And I started typing the, the refrain or the lyrics, God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, submission and relationship to rebellion. And these are things that are circling in my mind as I start to read a bit. Maya Angelou's beautiful and painfully brilliant contributions are juxtaposed here and what I wanna share with the poetic letter of Peaches in a 1969 open declaration to her parents that her love for quote, the people was her guiding light and a path of discipline. While Maya Angelou was living with her son in Ghana, she met and began working with Malcolm X. And so again, our politics are very complicated and very, um, very much like circles that radiate out from a core because we need each other, even if we don't politically agree with each other or our visions of religion or our visions of humanity and community. So Miss Angelou learned from Malcolm who was assassinated in 1965. And then of course we understand 68, Martin Luther King would be assassinated along with Bobby Kennedy. It's the constant loss in a violent world and a premier democracy that functions as empire that sees people as disposable. Even when we need our leaders to stay, they transition too soon and too violently. So I recall Angelou, I only really met her in the sense that I was in a huge gathering um, decades ago in the 1980s when James Baldwin died. And at the Cathedral of St. John's the Divine, a number of us walked from Union where we were seminarians and we walked south, you know, uh, down a, a number of blocks. Um, and we entered the cathedral, which was cavernous, right? It's just like a huge cave, right? It's like primal. Um, and there, Toni Morrison, Maya Angelou gave a eulogy for James Baldwin, who we also know loved us, right? And also was isolated as a black gay man who moved to France, who found that living in the United States to be unbearable. And so I'm really interested about your community in San Miguel. Um, when do you leave? When do you get to leave? And how are you still tethered to the democracy that also functions as empire? But what I remember from decades ago was both Angelou and Morrison expressing the spirit of Baldwin who had deceased, who had transitioned as an ancestor who still loved us. But that in a way, as ancestors would claim us, we would have to be able to claim them and their lineage. And that in part for me is not just an act of love, but it's also an act of courage. And unlike Angelou or Toni Morrison, who became these luminous writers and international celebrities and people would want to hear from them, like not just the writing, but also the voice, their very presence, because it was reassuring and they would never disappear. Like, because we have the text, we have the memory, we have the videotape, we have Peaches. And so Peaches is a black teenager in the 1960s who agreed and who wanted to, as an expression of agape, to join the Black Panther Party. Again, these it's not just that on the spectrum our politics are so diverse. I see them as circles, as concentric circles that we can move from this circle into this circle to the next spiral, flip it on the side. Because the way we love under, as Cliff said, 400 years, you know, if you go with Arab enslavement, it's, it's looking like more of a millennium. The way we live and get formed as a people under captivity is people who mutate. As Angelou said, the planks that cut into your bottom, the lies, the mask that you wear for submission so you don't get lynched or have your children disappear in foster care, right? These are constant zones of captivity which change us 
and change time and change how we occupy, occupy space. And so when I go to Peaches, and I don't know her last name, because it's her nickname. She is the opposite of Maya Angelou, but she's the same as Maya Angelou. Like it's the people who love us who will never be celebrities, who will you will never find on tape, you will never pick up their book from Amazon, not to say I'm advocating you shop at Amazon at all, right? But their disappearance is the reappearance of us. And it's it becomes like a song itself. Like what was played on the piano, what was seen with the youth, you know, singing the national anthem, which is actually now an international anthem, a global call, not just for love, but for survival and resilience. And so Peaches joins a party that the government and the FBI is gonna designate for extermination. And so the violence will be brutal, it will be legal in the sense that no one will ever go to prison, you know, for the assassination of Fred Hampton and Mark Clark in Chicago in 1969, in the same way in which there's police impunity today in terms of taking certain lives from people and communities that are not registered as fully human. And so this juxtaposition that I'm trying to do is not a contrast to say, that Maya needs to be like Peaches or Peaches needs to be like Maya. It's just a recognition that the, the stories we tell to ourselves and that others hear and pick up and tell among themselves, that the songs that we sing for ourselves and then they become global songs are the songs of struggle in which love is absolutely crucial, but how we manifest that love I think has been mystified and distorted and whether or not we're willing to love throughout pain and suffering within the context of a prison or jail like Rikers or an empire like the United States. I don't believe we have clarity. I believe we have religion, we have spirituality, but we don't have agreement. And now I'll let Peaches speak for herself. This is posted on Facebook, which I'm not on, but someone sent it to me. And I believe this would have happened in December 1969. December 4th, 1969 was when Fred Hampton and Mark Clark were assassinated. But within a week, the Los Angeles police practiced SWAT. That was their first, you know, weapons tactical team. And they practiced it on um, a Panthers headquarters in Southern California. And this is where Peaches would have been um, until she was through a very violent encounter where they shot up a lot of people, but people survived, unlike Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, and she was taken to jail. And then this is the letter that she wrote her parents, which I'm calling the agape, which is the love by political will of Peaches. The title is Open Letter to My Mom and Dad from Peaches, Political Prisoner. Mom, Dad. I'm communicating this way to you because it would take too much time and an emotion on my part to do so through glass windows and earphones. Mom and dad, you both have always wanted me to be someone you and others, most of all myself, could look up to and respect. All my life, I've been taught that people were people. All my life, you've told me that no matter what I was or how I was, be the best. Mom and dad, I am a panther. I am a revolutionary woman. I'm willing to fight and die for the rights of myself, my people, and all oppressed people in general. What greater pride can one have? How much dignity can one feel? How much respect can one receive if he or she takes the initiative to go after and fight for a goal? Mom and dad, I love you both for striving and working and sweating so that I might have the things that I needed. I love you both for what you've taught me. Sure, I could go out and hold any job I desire, have all the luxuries in life, get set and die of quote, natural end quote, death. But to me, there's more life than that. There are the people, people who need to be helped and loved. 
not stepped on, used and misled as we have been for so long. I have found what I've wanted out of life. I didn't find it in the streets or through dope or through luxuries. I found what I wanted through the Black Panther Party and that is to quote, love and serve the people, end quote. Please mom and dad, I love you for what you are and what you do. Can't you love me for what I am and what I do? Love your only child, Peaches. So for me, the question becomes whether or not we want children like Peaches whether we want to raise, whether there are biological or adopted, or just the children, the youth that we embrace, whether we want children that strong, the ones who would confront government, the ones who would give up the good job, the ones who would forego shopping and consumerism in order to love a people that is tangible and real, but also on a certain level, an abstraction, right? I mean, maybe this is why I can't quite fathom agape, even though I want to follow it. You know, my parents have transitioned, so I won't write something like this for them, but maybe this is what I write for my children, right? that it could have been about more accumulations. It could have been about more publications. It could have been about more politics that resonated with institutions that are well protected and shielded from poverty and war and its most horrific expressions. But perhaps it's this rejection of I don't wanna call it cynicism, but I wrote it down, so I have to read it. Perhaps it's Peaches' rejection of cynicism and the luxuries of what some would call bourgeois or middle-class or upper-class living that shapes her desire to serve. And then that's why agape shines. How we're influenced daily by celebrities, by leadership within democratic parties, by lobbyists, by constant news feeds on war and rumors of war, how we're overly influenced and distracted in ways that the disposability of the impoverished and captive communities don't fully register. Seems to me that perhaps this is the dialectical dance we're gonna be doing for some time, right? That I'll just talk for myself, <laughs> that working for institutions that are incredibly affluent, actually, I mean, literally they're billionaire clubs, sort of leverages a power where I think I can be helpful and useful. But it also pushes forward a deflection so that what I remember and what gets impressed upon me is the culture, the radical culture, the black culture that is more acceptable to the norm and not the cultures that get forgotten because we don't even know Peaches's birth name. And we wouldn't know how to find her, even though I'm sure she's down the block in Detroit, in the Bronx, in Brooklyn. But if we desire the agape of Peaches, do we accept the terms of sacrifice, because there's no way that you can love people who've been designated as Angelou aptly described, or I would say performed, but not in the sense of a performance of um, entertainment, but a performance of devastation and emotional recognition and reconciliation. That if we love that much, we'll be paid in ways in which a price will be exacted. If that makes sense, it sounds more convoluted. I could have gotten more directly. If we love that much, we will be punished, right? And that's why we were in the mask. So I'm starting to think as I've gotten older, 
maybe, you know, we take off the mask. And then people see who we are, not just in terms of how we suffer, but also in terms of our agency, which isn't always pretty. And it's not always something that can be reconciled with liberal culture or with multiracial cultural, you know, intent and commitments. So Peaches does not plead for family love or familial love. She does not plead for the love of democracy or the love of nation. She does not plead for the love of peace and stability. She pleads for the love of freedom that can be shared by everyone, including women in ICE detention camps who are taken to a so-called womb collector for sterilization, right? Including in Rikers jail in New York City where the suicide rates are skyrocketing and people are not taken to hospital visits or to mental health clinics, but they're brutalized or put again in solitary confinement, even though Barack Obama, and I have a lot of critiques on Barack Obama, but he did say that it was a human rights violation, right? And as I've said before, that we have a black mayor and a black woman, female police commissioner will not change the trajectory of predatory behavior. It'll just get a, bit, a nicer look, which is the same as when you have a black president or you have a black vice president and the nation still determines that money is more valuable than life. So as I would wrap up, I've written different things here, but I think the most pressing thing for me right now is what do you tell, I, you know, my short version is what do you tell the kids? I mean, what, do you, what do we say to the generation that follows? I mean, what I, I said in a recent interview with the Villanova people, I mean, I'm being, it was less an interview, it was more like I was being grilled, right? By a doctoral student at Princeton Seminary. It was, their whole language was about betrayal. And I started to wonder out loud if perhaps myself, I did implicate myself. If there were lies of omission, if we didn't love enough to say, I wanna go back to Miss Angelou. I'm, so, I'm glad that you, you put her first and forward, but I'm, I'm also, you kind of messed up my Sunday by doing that. <laughs> because I had a nice little clean read here that I'm like, oh my goodness. But this whole thing about submission, why would you stay on a planet without honor? Why would you respect yourself or other people when you're constantly dishonored? It seems to me the ask of the colonized and the captive and the formerly enslaved who are still shot up by police on a regular basis, or your kids disproportionately are taken in foster care, even though black families are no more pathological than white families and you know Latino, Chicano, Mexican-American families. I grew up in Texas, the data is there. But our very appearance is a register of pathology for everybody, like people grab their purses. I mean, they're like, you know, look, you know, Fanon, look, mom, and they grow, you know, it's, it's ongoing. So what does it mean to love in disposability zones? And what does it mean when the children, the youth tell you that you betrayed them because you submitted? Angelou says that our ancestors said the only reason we get to appear is because they lied and they wore the mask. Our youth today say, we are disappearing because you lied and you wore the mask. So it's like, okay, like what's the plan? It's untenable. 
but we keep loving. That's inevitable. But under these conditions, the mutations, the mutations are going to be fierce because we cannot deliver. Survival is not sufficient anymore. I mean, I've been working on this concept of the captive maternal because I've watched people care for people. And I've been, you know, from adopting to like my elders, you know, transitioning and trying to find dignity, which is really hard for anybody black to find dignity anywhere on any register. But I'm looking at the captive maternal and this sacrificial love in these different stages of complicity and compliance, wearing the mask, taking the mask off to protest, right? Having our leaders jailed, incarcerated, or assassinated, or just disappear because they have nervous breakdowns, reassembling, and then hearing the youth say, that was not enough. And so I want to close by thinking, hmm, I always say I don't have answers, and that's because that's the truth. I wonder if there are gifts that we can give before we transition. And if those gifts are shaped by abandoning ourselves to love, will a different kind of courage emerge? So even though they know that they will still have to give their children the talk about how you conduct yourself in public, say yes, sir, no, sir, to police, you know, because you can be disappeared in prison if you don't get beat down or shot. Even though the material conditions will endure in terms of predatory behavior, perhaps the recognition that we loved with a certain kind of courage and we mitigated the submission as Peaches did becomes a lifeline so that they agree to stay as long as possible not just on the planet, but in the struggle. And with that very painful, but beautiful template to follow, which is agape. And the only love now, I imagine, that will steer me through some of the roughest waters that we will face as our democracy slides into reactionary politics and somewhat of an abyss. So thank you for your contributions and the invitation to be in community.